obviously what you're seeing is a tour of the Juki sewing machine company. I decided to share this with you because it shows the quality, the caliber, the attention, the focus, the drive, the passion behind the way Japanese machines are made, whether it's the Juki or whether it's going to be like the Stitch Queen that we're going to look at today that belongs to my dear friend, Roz, from the great state of Michigan. So, different machine makers, I get it, but the same passion, the same concept, the same attention to detail is driven within the Japanese circles that make sewing machines, both, both post-World War II and most certainly into the future. Uh, Juki is still one of those manufacturers that I would rank up there as one of the best in the world, and they've stuck to their guns. They've stuck to that quality, that caliber. Yes, they have. So, let's change this shot a little bit, and I'll put on some more music. Matter of fact, we'll listen to that song one more time. It's called Imperial Forces, and I love it. Obviously, the music that I selected today is going to have a lot of Japanese-type flavor to it. Let's go to the other workbench and see what I have set up over here. Konnichiwa! Bogenki deska! Genki desu? Good. Well, if you're brand new to this channel, my friend in the middle is Umi, and she is from the beautiful country of Japan. Yes, she is. So you're saying, okay, what's on the workbench, Scott? Talk to us. Tell us. Tell us what's going on. Well, all the way in the front, center stage, in a prominent location, is Raz's Stitch Queen, Japanese made. Absolutely. All of you, when I showed picture this, pictures of this on Facebook, you were like, oh my goodness gravy. That is such a beautiful looking machine. Such a, such a pretty color. And the Japanese love their blues, don't they? Kind of a robin blues, robin blue egg type color. And yet in stark contrast to the back, we've got another Japanese machine a universal that is a carbon copy of the Singer Class 15 machine. Specifically, if you were to put it up against, say, a 15-91 and measure it end-to-end -end and measure it needle-to-pillar and measure all the other heart measurements on this machine, you would find that it is, I, is, it's an identical replica. And I'm shutting off my phone real quick. It's an identical replica of the Singer Class 15. Why is that? Well, you, you that are very, very smart students already know that in our effort to help the Japanese rebuild their economy post-World War II, we get done by ending the war by dropping bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Hundreds of thousands of Japanese citizens are killed tragically. They, they, they really didn't, other than living in the country, they really didn't have anything to do with the war per se, but that's what the U.S. decided to do to bring that war to a close. And many people a lot smarter than me or you have said, you know what, it was a horrible thing to do, but it really ended up in the end saving potentially millions of lives if that war had been drawn out and gone to kind of a, uh, you know, a, a ground force type thing and all the other blah, blah, blah stuff. So what do they say? War is ugly, right? But out of those ashes of that war came some gorgeous machines like Raz's and like this black, this ebony colored universal. Let me come off the tripod and show you a little bit 
closer up kind of what what I'm talking about here we'll listen to some more music that at least according to YouTube has Japanese type ties all right I want the tripod and check these machines out and I've got one other I'd like to show you as well so all of these machines, including Raz's right in the front, are considered Japanese clone machines because the schematics, the designs, the patents, the drawings, the blah, 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 were all used by the Japanese to make these machines and then they exported them and imported them into the States and a lot of other places around the world. So you can see the, the similarities between the machines, whether it's the bobbin winding style that you'll see here, very, very similar here, also very similar here. The stitch controller for length. And even though they made slight variations of the badge mark, you can even see some of, some of the common ground features of the badge mark on these different machines. Like on Roz's machine right here. And you'll notice the one thing unique about Roz's machine, because it came out a little bit later than these other two, is they eliminated, eliminated the word Japan on the badge mark. Look at that badge mark closely. Matter of fact, I'll zoom in on it for you. Look at that badge mark closely, and you'll notice they, they use words like deluxe. They come up with a fictitious sewing machine company name here to give it the impression that, okay, it's just a, it's a totally different company. It's a totally different company. And, you know, they just, they kind of stepped away from that proud badge mark of Japan, like you'll see on the other two this precision one that's labeled uh, Sovereign. On this one, they still have Made in Japan there on the bottom. Same thing about this Class 15 clone that is just an absolute mirror image of the Singer Class 15. Notice here, they still have Japan on that badge mark prominently, proudly. But you know what? What usually trumps pride and uh, being proud of you know your country of origin is money and when americans who still had that bitter taste in their mouth from world war ii and the awful combat that we had with the japanese people americans saw that japan and it was just right away like putting a sliver underneath your fingernail ever gotten one of those yeah Oh, they're so uncomfortable. They're so painful. Well, that sting of war was still very much in the front of mind for Americans. So when they saw this and they saw this, it was like, ah, uh, no, no, no. They got very upset about it. They got very upset. So the Japanese being innovators, being super smart, they said, okay, well, we need to mix it up a little bit then. We need to mix it up. And that's what they did by the time they got to machines like Raz's, where they totally eliminated the word Japan from the machine. And I was looking on the, the pillar because sometimes they would sneak it on the pillar where it was less prominent as you looked at the machine. But they even removed it from there on this machine as well. Yes, they did. So, Japanese are smart business people. So, when you look at these three machines, common traits, commonalities, common ground, but you saw the subtle changes that came about to make that machine more marketable, to make it more palatable to Americans that still had that sting of war in the front of their mind. They had that bitterness, that that yucky feeling when it came to the Japanese people. 
no offense, Umi, you know me, I, I love you. But that's the way it was back then. Yeah, it, absolutely. She says, I know, war is ugly and it makes people ugly, is what she just said. And, and that's spot on. It's spot on, isn't it? So this premiere today is about Raza's machine, this this evolution of the Japanese machines. But I have other one other one I'd like to show you that was a little bit earlier. And you notice all of these three Japanese-made machines have similar lines. They're curvy. They're kind of sexy looking, aren't they? And obviously, all being class 15s, you'll notice that they all have that tension control on the faceplate, like Raz's machine right here, the one to the rear, back over here. Also, beautiful faceplates, too. Did you notice that? This one here. A lot of attention to detail. Again, it's Japanese made. The Japanese are very much attention to detail. Look at Raz's faceplate. Isn't that lovely? But these are all class 15 machines, and you can tell because of the location of the tensioner. Same thing on this ebony styled one as well. Beautiful ornamental type faceplate, and then they move that tensioner over to the faceplate area as well. And, and there's a lot of arguments in circles as to why was that upper tension moved from the front of the machine to the faceplate. Everything that I found has indicated the move occurred because they wanted to give better visibility down at the needle. When you put a upper tension unit right here, it's distracting. It's even obscuring to some, some, some extent. And so when you move it over to here, like on Raza's machine and these other two Japanese clone machines, all of a sudden you open up that field of vision and you've got clear visibility right down to that needle. So that really is the reason. I'm not sure what Facebook groups, you know, those supposed experts on the Facebook groups say, but I can tell you as an expert, and I think uh, my, my friend Alex over in the UK would agree, it was a great move. It was a very, very smart move uh, to do that. To give that visibility factor. So let me show you another Japanese clone machine that I have in my personal collection. So the one in the front again belongs to Roz from the great state of Michigan. The other two are in my personal collection. So if you're involved with that Willy Wonka contest right now and you say, I want to receive a, a behind the scene tour of Scott's workshop, either in person or virtually, so that I can pick one of the machines from his personal collection. Well, the two machines in the back, that gorgeous Ebony Universal uh, style Class 15 machine, and then that very pretty Robin's Egg kind of color uh, machine on the right, these are both in my personal collection. So these are two of the machines out of those 200 so machines that you're going to see as the winner of that final golden ticket for that contest we're doing right now to benefit the Okanto Area Humane Society. So you're getting kind of a pre-glimpse, at least of two of the machines. And like that funny guy in the classroom in the movie Willy Wonka where he's trying to teach the students percentages. And he's really not very good at it, by the way. Because he could have calculated Charlie Bucket's only two Wonka bars out of, say, 100. He could have done that very easily, but he chose not to. So, whatever. But... These are only two of the 200 or so machines that I have. So, I mean, just a tiny little fraction. Type in the chat if you're a mathematician. If you're seeing two of my 200 machines, what percentage is that? What percentage is that? Two out of 200. Yeah, yeah, do that right now. And you'll be on my best student list, and you'll get a gold star for the day, and... If you show up after this, you're late. You're late. So one of the veterans, and at this particular premiere today, Emma is the one that's going to be issuing the late passes. So if you show up after I just rang the bell right there to the classroom, you better reach out to Emma and say, Emma, could you hook me up? As a matter of fact, I'll broaden it a little bit, and I'll say either Emma or if Roz is at the premiere, she also, as a veteran and as the owner of the beautiful machine in the foreground, will be able to also grant you a late pass so that you're not penalized 
for arriving at class late. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so let me see if I can put on a little bit more music and then I will show you this other Japanese machine as well. So which one should I remove to make room for it? The one on the left or the one on the right? I think I'll remove the ebony one simply because the other one I wanted to show you is colored similar to these other two. So we'll have a trinity of beautiful Robin's egg color type machines on the workbench. And if you don't know it, many of these Japanese machines were made from the sunken ships that were part of the World War II war. It's kind of redundant, isn't it? World War II war. Yeah. But you get what I'm saying. These makers over in Japan, metal is a precious commodity, especially when you're coming out of a war and a lot of it's been used to make armaments and munitions and everything like that. So you've got these huge ships not too far offshore that are just sitting there with hundreds and thousands of tons of steel, typically gonna be right around uh, 16 gauge steel, was very commonly used on ships. So what are they gonna do with it? They're gonna make sewing machines. The problem with that though is gravity. No, the problem with that is, see if I can get this on the workbench here. The problem with that is that when you have steel sitting in salt water for extended periods of time, it starts to cause rusting. And certainly you can cover up some of those initial signs of rusting by, uh, you know, doweling it up with uh, layers of uh, lacquer type paint and clear coating and decaling and all that kind of stuff to, you know, to, to make it look pretty. But inevi inevitably that rust will work its way to the surface. And that was the, the problem with a number of the Japanese machines that came out post-World War II. So I'm going to come off the tripod one more time and give you a closer look of uh, this other machine that was a little bit earlier than the other two that you're looking at on the workbench. The two on the right, Roz's machine and then my machine in the rear there, the Sovereign machine, uh, both have that uh, kind of a, a stylized, curvy, sexy look to them, like the Class 15s you'd expect to see from Singer. But the one on the left is a little bit boxier. I, I would almost call it kind of the Volvo, the early Volvo of the Japanese style machines. And then they all of a sudden discovered, you know, we got we got to make them a little bit sexier, a little bit more curvaceous, and uh, and they'll sell better. And again, it comes back to money, doesn't it? With any company, it comes back to money. Let's hear that song one more time. It's lovely, isn't it? That one is called Minyo San Kayuko. Yeah. So here's an earlier Class 15 style that the Japanese came out with. Like I said, it's kind of kind of shaped like a, a Volvo. It's also a little bit more plain Jane. Look at that faceplate. It's shiny, it's pretty, but it doesn't have any, uh, any of that decorative scroll type work on it. You know, like this one that I have in my personal collection. Or like Raza's right here, which is even a little bit more ornamental, isn't it? But this again shows you that the Japanese were serious about this business. They were very serious about it. They wanted to have it be a very, very successful part of their manufacturing rebuild effort. And so every opportunity that, that they had to come up with a new design, this one again is a little bit more si simple. It's not nearly as uh, ornamental. Tell me about, uh, in the chat, a machine that Singer made they came out with an initial version as a 99K and a 99. And then they wanted to come up with a more simplistic, less fancy version 
and they came out with another one that was a mirror image of the original one, but it, it didn't have any de any or ornate decaling on it. It was very simplistic. Can you remember that machine? And it comes by two names. It comes by a fancy model number, and then it comes by a shortened name that a lot of people refer to it as. So type it in the chat if you know what I'm talking about. Again, it's a Singer machine that had three different versions, and, and one of them was much more simplistic, but it came with a larger motor. There's another big clue for you. So here we have a more simplistic, less frilly type Japanese clone machine. And then we come to other models like this that will have similar decal patterns, but a little bit more ornate, a little bit more sexy. All beautiful machines in their own right. I think you would agree. They're really lovely. Yeah. So let's get busy. And the other thing you'll notice about Roz's machine is it doesn't have a light with it. So we're going to be relying on the LED light above to shine light down on that bed and down on that needle. Yeah. This one also, you can see, did not come equipped with a light either. Some did, some didn't. So. All right. I'm going to try to get it set up with a string of music so I don't have to keep jumping up. So let's focus on Roz's machine right now so you can you can look at that and study that a little bit more as I'm getting some music set up. And I, as you can see straight away, the, the thread I, I chose for Roz's machine because it matched uh, the branding of the badge mark down here, the filigree on the bed, and then also the, uh, the, the badge marking and the filigree type uh, decals here and here as well. So I've gone with that uh, Coat, Coats and Clark Trilobal embroidery type thread. It's going to be right around 40 weight, a little bit heavier than, say, a standard Coats and Clark thread that usually will come in around 30, 30 weight type thread. So it's a little bit heavier. It gives us a little bit more uh, capacity and versatility to be able to go through heavier leathers like the saddle grade leather that's underneath the needle right now. Uh, and some of the other heavy grade type sewing we'll be doing as well. We're going to be sewing today with a Schmetz size 90 universal needle. And I chose that very intentionally because the Japanese, when they designed a number of their machines, they would brand them universal. And so I chose that just to be a little bit more, you know, a little bit more grounded to the Japanese type uh, flavor of things. And again, we're dealing with a size 9014, not a super huge needle, probably about medium grade size when it comes to the size of needles, but it should get the job done for all the sew-offs that we're going to be doing. The other thing I didn't show you yet, and I'll show you real quick, and then I'll pick out some music for us, is I've mentioned before during sew-offs, when a machine blasts through leather or something like that, I'll say, gosh, I wish I had a button so that I could hit it, kind of like that Office Max people or whatever they are, uh, and, you know, do the that was easy type thing. So I've actually picked one up, and I'll be using that periodically in premieres. So after a sew-off, when the machine has gotten it done so easily, I'll give that button a push, and you'll hear something like this. That was easy. Yeah, he's almost kind of soft. He's not really super loud either it's kind of a kind of a soft that was easy so let me pick out some music you admire Roz's beautiful post war war II japanese clone machine and i'll get it set up with some more music some more music let's see what we have here so i typed in japanese now i'm going to type in asian See what we get for that. Okay. I have no idea what these are going to sound like, but we'll give them a go.
Well, as you might have suspected, and I'm going to move this other foot control out of the way. It belongs to this earlier version of a Class 15 by the Japanese. As you might have guessed, we're going to start with saddle grade leather. So I'm going to zoom in towards the needle. And this again is the type of needle we're going to be using today. The Japanese loved two words in particular when it came to their machines. They loved the word universal and they loved the word deluxe. You'll see that on a lot of the Japanese clone machines. Lots of them. So this saddle grade leather again is going to be about three to four ounces thick. Because of the way it's processed and stuff, it's going to be super, super tough to get through, even a single layer. But what I want to do on this first sew off is show the control and show the, the navigation ability of this machine. Uh, the feed dogs on these machines were built very well, very much like some of the recent machines that you've seen, uh, the, the Husqvarna's and also that Elna machine as well that has the pyramid style uh, feed dogs that were very unique to the Elna brand. The Japanese came up with their own version. I would almost call them a shark tooth type design where they, they grab hold of that material. And once they grab hold, they are not going to let go. They're going to move it through the process and, and get us to the finish line. So we should see some really good material feed on Raza's machine today. Some really, really good material feed, no matter what we sew. And I'm hoping that this will automatically advance, but it might not. It might not. Let's see here. Well, I guess I'll be the clicker. I'll, I'll be the clicker. I don't know why it's not advancing, but it's not. So... I'm just going to click us to the next one. The next one is called uh, East Eastminster. Eastminster. So this particular sew off is going to be again focusing on certainly the strength of this machine, because again we're talking about four ounces of uh, saddle grade leather, but we're also talking about being able to sew in a circle, which I enjoy doing, as you know so that we can show that this machine is, number one, you can harness the power, number two, you're also able to uh, make those turns without necessarily coming to a full stop, as I have to do sometimes when I'm sewing on other machines. So, all right, here we go. Give a listen. Really, really holding that power back right now. Nice and steady. Really backing it down now here as we get near the end. And stop. That was a little bit of fun. I know if Roz was in the workshop right now, she would say, let me do it. Let me do it. And I would be glad to do that. But Roz is all the way over in Michigan. So, Roz, I did that for you, dear. All right, so let's give this a look and see what we think. Goodness gravy, I can already tell you what I think. 
Isn't that spectacular? <laughs> and I sold over some of my threads. So I'll have to work those loose. Alright, well I'll fix it. <clears throat> and if you can't see in the shot, because I did the final stitching on my Willy Wonka vest using Roz's machine that we're premiering today, I decided to wear my Willy Wonka vest as a product of this machine. All right, let me see if I can unravel all of these threads I sewed over now going in my, my circle. See what I did right there? It's the only problem with sewing in a circle is you, you tend to create problems like this, at least I do. You can enjoy, enjoy the beautiful Japanese music while I'm trying to right my wrong here. edit. Some people would say, you ought to edit, man. You ought to edit. No, I'm going to show you guys when I, when I have struggles, I have struggles, and that's okay. And we can make it right. There we go. I took a little extra effort, and I left a couple of these that I ended up sewing the thread over them. They're, they're going to be a little bit darker, but you get the idea. You're smart. All right, let's take a look at these. Oh, you can already see them. Beautiful. Well, let's look at totality of the stitching first. Again, we're looking at a single layer of uh, of saddle grade leather and all leathers are going to have different difficulty levels when it comes into the comes to the piercing threshold near the very top of those leathers next to leathers like protected full grain leather and the like uh, you're going to have saddle grade leather this stuff is going to really really raise the bar on the difficulty factor when it comes to sewing it. And that's what I like. I like these premieres to be the sewing Olympics. I want it to be tough. Just like if you're watching an Olympian perform, you know that they're making it look fairly easy, just like Roz's machine just did. But you know that if you tried it, it would be incredibly tough. But it's the preparation, right? It's the training of the Olympian. And in our case, it's the preparation of all the work I pour into machines before they ever get to the workbench to be premiered. Other channels, somebody will polish them up a little bit, drop a little bit of oil in, and they'll just fly by the seat of their pants. That is not the standard of the workshop. That is not going to work here. I'm going to spend on a machine like Roz's about 14 hours from start to finish, including the motor work I had to do on this as well as we'll see on Facebook. But let's first of all look at the stitches because that's really what it comes down to, right? It comes down to the stitches. So as you look at these stitches right here, these are absolutely page 34. Absolutely page 34. You can hear uh, Hank upstairs announcing something. Aren't those lovely? Let me pause right there and also uh, give us the opportunity for some more beautiful Japanese music. And again, we are not using a leather needle. We're using a universal needle by Schmetz, which is supposed to allow us a great deal of flexibility. I'm loosening up my camera real quick so I can flow a little bit better through these stitches. You know what? Give me a second. I'm going to come off the tripod.
to get up close to these so I can show them to you a little bit more easily. So first of all, totality of the stitching. Yeah, right about there, I think it's pretty good. The stitch caliber of this machine is really quite phenomenal. We'll look at multiple rows at the same time, which is another advantage of kind of coming off the tripod. The spacing, the formation, the integrity of the stitch, it just doesn't get any better than this, all the way to the very middle. And we were slowing it, we were sewing at a very slow rate to be able to manage that power. And that was exactly the right thing to do so I could get all the way to that point. I might have been able to do one more turn, but I pushed it about as far as I wanted to go, all the way to that point right there where we stopped. And you can see, as you look at this stitching, once the camera decides to focus again, you can see straight away the caliber of that stitching. It's, it's a solid page 34, if not a page 34 plus. And that really is indicative of the Japanese machines for the most part. They've got an oscillating hook system. And oscillating hook systems when it comes to generating stitching are a lot less problematic than a rotary hook system because that hook is not having to go full circle. Look at that leather again from the side and then look across there to the stitching that Roz's machine just laid down. Absolutely spectacular. Let's turn it over now and look at that lock stitch and see what we think of that. A little bit hard pressed to see it and obviously holding the camera I'm not able to pull these back, but we'll get as close as we can. I'm literally just an inch away from the leather right now, so we can try to get a glimpse of that lock stitching. There we go, there we go, right there. And that is a solid page 34 as well, isn't it? Just absolutely spectacular. After I cleaned up my mess of sewing over the thread. <laughs> so, very impressed with this and you can you can right away look at that grain and see what I'm talking about. It's got a flatter grain like vegetable tan leather, but don't let that deceive you. It is incredibly difficult leather to get through, which is why it gets its name. I mean, you're talking about leather that's used for making saddles and gun holsters and other durable goods like that. You know right away that this is gonna be anything anything at all but an easy sew off. And yet, this Japanese clone from post-World War II got the job done so easily, it's, it's almost insulting to the machine how easily it got it done. It was kind of like, yeah. That was easy. Yeah, yeah, that was easy. Definitely easy. So, so I'm gonna throw this to the back as a definite pass, and I'll put it on the bed of our Volvo style Japanese machine set that right back there and these are some of the off-camera ones that I did to get ready for this premiere uh, two thicknesses of uh, genuine elk hide you can look at the thickness of that it's about eight to ten ounces of leather and laid down just a spectacular uh, top stitch and also a lock stitch this is our lock stitch obviously because we only have one uh, stitch row as I added that second layer of the elk hide. But look at those stitches. At that point, by the time I tore apart the upper tension and got the machine just to a point of being spectacular, uh, it laid down page 34 plus stitching through these two layers of elk hide. And we'll du duplicate that again during this premiere. I don't just show you stuff that I did off camera and then not try to duplicate it on camera. I want you to see it done live on a premiere as well. Uh, not because you don't trust me, you, you know that I did this on this machine, but there's others that do use other machines and then try to associate it with another machine, which is just not the way to operate, right? It's not the way to operate. So gives you an idea of the strength of this machine being able to 
buzz through two layers of genuine elk hide and do it like a hiccup. And then I was also using some uh, more standard, this is like a polyester blend material, and just testing the different uh, stitch length variations, all the way from right around six stitches per inch, all the way down into that uh, satin range where we're, we're doing teeny tiny stitching at the top row there. And just absolutely spot on. And these are some of the earliest ones as I was taking the machine through adjustments in that. So the caliber of stitching we'll see, even as spectacular as this is, will uh, in all likelihood be even greater today, even though we're using a universal needle and not a specialized needle for woven materials or something like that. So let's throw that to the back as well. I'll make two different little piles, one for our off camera on the left there, and then one for our on camera right there as we start to build our pile. So, but I really am, um, people ask me all the time, what do you think of the Japanese clone machines? There are some good ones and there are some bad ones. And um, by bad, I mean ones that were later in the phase of that rollout of machines from Japan. And like a lot of companies, they discovered that they could make the machines more cheaply. And they could be less precision driven when it came to calibrating those machines so they would perform at a high level. And engineering those machines so that they were quality. Uh, so Roz is thankfully is in that boat of quality high caliber Japanese machines. Uh, there's others out there that I would not give that same accolade to. So let's uh, zoom in and I'll pick out a little bit more music. I wish I could figure out why I'm in the library mode right now that YouTube gives me where I should be able to click one song and then it'll scroll through all the other songs that are on there, but it's not doing it. It did it before the premiere, but it's not doing it now after the premiere. So let's, I'm going to be resolute and see if I can figure out why. See if I can figure out why. Come on. All right, let's see what we get here. Oh, okay, let's try that. All right, this is just a test. Some of these songs you've already heard before, but I'm clicking the first one to see if it will now go through automatically. I hope it does. This one is called Imperial Forces. Imperial Forces. And I will walk you around the machine a little bit and just show you the, the way it's set up. It's, it's, it's a very simple machine, I think, to operate. But uh, I'll show you the lay of the land anyway. And that way, if you get a hold of one or you've got one, you're not going to be at a loss for how to maximize that machine, especially if you don't have an owner's manual. Owner's manuals were not as commonly distributed with a lot of these Japanese clone machines. I guess the assumption was get a singer, get a singer manual and it's going to be the same. There we go. I had to dial up uh, this beautiful machine just a little bit. Well, I just showed you that elk hide that I did off camera, so why don't we do some on camera now? Two layers of elk hide, you can see that from the side, right around eight to 10 ounces of genuine elk hide. If you're new to this channel, elk hide is chemically processed. When you chemi chemically process a leather like this, similar to protected full grain leather, you're gonna galvanize that surface, which is gonna push the piercing threshold through the roof. Yeah, I had to kind of go with the music there a little bit to make it more dramatic. All right. Let's see how Roz's machine does with this. And thankfully, we've got the benefit of a little bit of a hyperextension. I shouldn't say a little bit, quite a bit, quite a bit actually. Quite a bit of hyperextension on this Japanese clone machine. So we're able to fit those two layers of Elkite underneath there very, very, very easily. All right, so let's buzz down this and see what we get. 
gonna back it up a little bit. I'm way, way too far forward. There we go. All right, I think I have it finally. <clears throat> so two layers of genuine elk hide, and I have the stitch setting right now at the larger size, and I've got my presser foot pressure up pretty high, so we should get some really good feed and some good caliber stitching. So let's see. Here we go. Well, and that happens sometimes. I was pulling on that a little bit anxious and I just popped my thread, which works out nicely because I can show you how to pull that thread back up now from the raceway. And again, we are working with an embroidery thread, so it might not be, even though it's around 50 weight, it's not gonna be as resolute. Oh, look at what else happened, see that? That thread kind of came away from the, the roll of the bobbin and it caught on the outside, which explains also why partly our thread was not feeding well. So we've got to, we've got to resolve that as well. As we're looking at this, you'll notice that the thread is feeding from the bottom. So I'm going to join these two together again right now. We'll look for that little slat, draw it through the slat and then get it underneath that tension band. And obviously as this is turning, it's going to be turning counterclockwise. You kind of see that if I turn it around here and pull it. Just think of it, right now it looks like it's turning clockwise, but imagine it turned the other way as if, as if it's in, installed in the machine, it's going to be turning counterclockwise. And again, you only want to have about three or four ounces of pull on that uh, bobbin case. And again, with a class 15 bobbin cases, there's going to be some where that finger on top is going to be pointing to the 11 o'clock position. There's going to be other instances where it's pointing at right around the one o'clock position. Roz's is at the one o'clock position. So I just drew that bobbin thread back up after I broke it because it had kind of come off of the thread of the spool a little bit. And we'll resume sewing. There's the real deal in the classroom. We sometimes experience challenges, don't we? But that's okay. That's okay. I sewed over my thread again, just fixing that real quick, see? of extra effort there but that's okay so this is the sew off we just did two layers of genuine elk hide we'll look at that top stitch first and then we'll turn it around and look at that lock stitch once I pull another extra little piece of thread out of there there we go Okay, top stitch first and then lock stitch. Let's take a look at this. Well, we can pretty much see the totality of stitching already right from there. And it is tip top. Let's zoom in and take a look at it closer.
pause right there. Folks, that is some solid page 34 stitching. I'll go back again so you can see it a second time. And again, we're not using a leather needle. We're using a universal needle. Solid page 34. Wow. Wow. Absolutely amazing. Amazing job by this Japanese clone machine. Totality of the stitching, I won't come all the way out because it's just too far. Come right about to there, maybe. Kind of lock the camera in place. Folks, the spacing, the formation, the integrity of the stitch, the presentation of the stitch. Go to page 34. It'll say, see Roz's machine. Because that's exactly what we want to be seeing. Let's turn it over and look at that lock stitch. There we go. So again, a lock stitch is always going to be a little bit more difficult to produce because of that gravity factor of pulling that embroidery thread, 50 weight embroidery thread. Actually, correction, it's closer to 40 weight embroidery thread by Coates and Clark. So 40 weight embroidery thread, this trilobal stuff, pulling it all the way back up through those two layers of, uh, of genuine elk hide. So it, it's done a fantastic job. The, the look of that stitch is exactly what we want to be seeing on page 34. Exactly spot on. Exactly spot on. Beautiful stitching. And look at that top edge again of what two layers of genuine elk hide looks like. Folks, that is the real deal right there. I'm going to go back across again. And you notice this Japanese clone, when it, when it was piercing that leather with a universal needle, it didn't hit that surface and pause and go, ugh, ugh. It just went through it like a knife, like a hot knife through butter. Beautiful stitching. Totality of the stitching on this lock stitch, these two layers of uh, genuine elk hide. Folks, you're hard pressed to get, get it any better than that. And yet we're still going to call it a near perfect stitch. We're not going to call it a perfect stitch. As perfect as that stitch is... Um, you know, other than adding a roller foot or a walking foot, um, we're at about the top of the game right there for this uh, Japanese clone machine, this Stitch Queen, as, as it's referred to. So, uh, very, very satisfied with that. I'll definitely move that to the back as a pass as we continue to enjoy some Japanese music, which is still not playing automatically. <laughs> So, so far we've done saddle grade leather, some very intricate sewing, showing the navigations, showing that we can harness the power, and now we just completed the sew off with two layers of genuine elk hide. I could stop here, but we're going to keep driving forward and pressing this Japanese machine to do more, to do more. But before we ask it to do more, I'm going to walk you around and just give you a brief tutorial on this machine. As a matter of fact, you know what, if I come off the tripod, I can do that even easier, can't I? Sort of, kind of. Let's do that. So first of all, looking at the front of this machine that belongs to Roz, we can see right here we've got a feed dog drop control. We can either turn this all the way to the down position so that we can do freehand embroidery or free motion quilting, or we can take it down in gradual levels so we reduce that feed dog pull if we're working with satins or silks or more delicate materials. So it's fully up right now. If we're sewing something that's a little bit more delicate, we could drop it to three, drop it to two, or if it's really delicate, we could drop it all the way down to one. And as you gradually come down in those different phases, 
those feed dogs go down further and further below the throat plate so that they're pulling that material less. But it's a, a very, very convenient way to adjust that feed dog pole right here on the front of the bed where you can get to it very easily. Other places it's more difficult to access. So I think again, that's, that's very smart engineering and design on the part of the Japanese. Obviously our spool pin for winding a bobbin, we put our spool right there, we come through this tensioner right there and then we come up to this bobbin winding assembly and to engage it we just push this right here it locks into the balance wheel obviously we would turn this balance uh, wheel clutch this stop action towards us to disengage the drive of the machine so that if we have it threaded we don't create a big mess uh, and then once it's done winding a bobbin uh, it'll it should automatically disengage because that bobbin is going to be in contact with this threshold and it'll cause it to pop up. The other beauty of this design as well is this little little knob right here allows you to adjust the distance of the wheel to the inside rim of the balance wheel. In other words, if you push it down and you, you can't even get it to lock in place because it's just, it's, it's way too snug, then you would just turn this counterclockwise and it slowly brings that wheel up and away from the rim of the balance wheel so then when you try to push it again it locks in beautifully so that really is a great fine adjuster for this bobbin winding assembly that uh, is very very specific to the Japanese machines although certainly other makers came up with certain uh, you know designs that were similar to it so I'm gonna go ahead and disengage that again so we don't have the drag of that bobbin winding tire on the rim of the balance wheel Here's our stitch length, and you can see right now we're at the largest stitch setting, right around six, and then we can go all the way down to 30 stitches per inch. Again, this is going to be pretty much a mirror image of the Singer design, even down to this right here where we can set boundaries. And then if we move this stitch length uh, lever all the way to the top, we're going to be sewing in reverse. To thread this machine, I wouldn't say it's overly complicated, but it's a little tricky. So coming off the spool, we're gonna to come to the rear of the machine and we're gonna come across this thread guide right here. We then come from there, and I'm gonna actually rotate this a little bit towards the light because we don't have the best of lighting right there. Plus I can access it a little bit easier. So we come off the top and then after coming off the top, we come through the tension discs and always make sure again when you're threading that your presser foot lever is in the up position so there's no pressure on those discs. So you then come through the discs, you come around the bottom, and then after you come around the bottom, you're gonna come behind this thread guide right here. Come behind it and then come over the top of it, see that? Then you're gonna come through this take-up spring right here, and then you're gonna follow it up to your take-up arm and thread it from left to right. You've then got a thread guide on the face plate you need to go through right here. You've got another thread guide right down here, just above the needle, and then you're gonna be threading this machine from left to right. And also as you're setting this needle you need to make sure that the flat side, just like on the Singer Class 15s, the flat side is pointing towards the motor or the pillar, okay? So flat side on the right, thread from left to right, and then I've just shown you the threading diagram as well. And again, when it comes to uh, setting up the bobbin for sewing, make sure that you're having that thread come from underneath so it's turning counterclockwise as that thread is feeding uh, through the machine. Okay, and again, some of these bobbin cases for the Class 15s, you'll see that Roz's has that finger at right around the one o'clock position. Other versions will have that finger orientated the other direction, and it'll be at, a, at the 11 o'clock position. So if you ever order a replacement bobbin case for a Class 15, particularly the Japanese clone machines, make sure you, you order the right one and that you don't get one where the finger is orientated at the 11 o'clock position and you go to try to install it and guess what? It's not gonna work. So, uh, you know, just be a smart consumer as I know you are and uh, 
be very careful if you're ordering replacement parts. But it really is, uh, it's a brilliant, a brilliant machine when it comes to the engineering. Of course, the brilliance ultimately has to transfer back to Singer, who the Japanese modeled their machines after. This I showed you in another premiere is your presser foot uh, lever. Uh, yeah, excuse me. This is your presser foot lever. <laughs> this is your presser foot uh, uh, fine adjuster. You push this, it's a quick release. It pops all the way up, so you have no presser foot pressure. So right now, if we tried to sew something, that material would not be feeding very well. And the general rule is if you're sewing more delicate materials, and I'll actually reach for them to kind of show you. If you're sewing more delicate materials, like this 100% cotton, or this 100% polyester ribbon material. Um, and I don't think, I, I don't know if I cut any satin or not. I don't think I did in this instance, but that's okay. So the more delicate side, like materials like this, what you're going to do is you're not going to go full bore. Full bore would be pushing this all the way down. And now we're at max. So that presser foot pressure is intense, pushing down with that presser foot against those feed dogs. So we don't want that necessarily if we're sewing incredibly delicate. So we would come down in gradual stages, maybe to there, or to there, or to there, or maybe even all the way to there. And then as we're sewing the heavier stuff like we just did with this elk hide and this saddle grade leather, we're going to go max. So we're going to push it all the way down like that. Okay? But if we're sewing the more delicate things again, we'll kind of back that off. We'll pop it all the way up and then we'll, we'll kind of, we'll kind of, you know, a, it's, it's a little bit of a spitballing game to some extent, but as you're sewing the more delicate things, just know that you want to back off that presser foot pressure a little bit, but you don't want to back it off too much either because like you saw in that recent premiere, when you don't have adequate feed, what happens is you might have your stitch uh, length controller giving, you know, supposedly giving you six stitches per inch. But if you have inadequate presser foot pressure, you might get a stitch more like that on the top row because that material is not feeding adequately. Or you'll get something more like that, the second row up, instead of getting something more like that first row down there on the bottom. So just realize presser foot pressure is very important because it can impact dramatically what your stitch output is going to be regardless of where you set your stitch length controller. So this and this really do work together very, very intimately to generate ultimately what you get as far as the stitch length. Hopefully that makes sense. So, yeah. So we talked about graduating back that uh, presser foot pressure a little bit. Let's do some 100% cotton now. We'll kind of go to the light side this is where our presser foot pressure is right now. I think that might be a little bit on the light side, to be honest with you. But we're going to give it a go. We'll stitch down. We'll leave our stitch length right over here on 6, and we'll see what we get. If we don't get a nice, robust stitch, we're going to increase this a little bit to give a little bit more downward pressure to give better feed factor so we can get a better outcome as far as uh, that stitch length. So I'm going to go back on the tripod. And we'll give this a go, see what we think. Yeah, YouTube is not being too nice to me today with not allowing these songs to play automatically. I'm not always a fan of the automatic, but it is kind of a nice option to have, you know? Okay, so we'll go right about there. I should also probably sneak a drink of water too, shouldn't I? Let's see here. I think I'll type in the search word flute now and see what kind of options we get for flute. And this may not be Japanese flavor, but it should have kind of a pretty sound to it, like a lot of the Japanese music. I'm going to grab a drink of water. If you want to grab a drink of water as well, it's perfect timing to do that. Ah, oh, there we go.
we go. So again, we're going to be experimenting a little bit. We've adjusted our presser foot pressure down, and now we'll see if our estimation of presser foot pressure was spot on or whether or not we get a stubby stitch. A stubby stitch will indicate, because we haven't changed the presser foot, uh, we haven't changed the uh, stitch length lever. <clears throat> if we get a stubby stitch, then it's a presser foot issue as far as feed. So let's see. Again, we've got two layers of 100% cotton, so we're basically piecing together cotton very much like a, a quilter would do. All right, here we go. I would be inclined to say I would be inclined to say that uh, our pressure might be a little bit on the light side I'll show you in just a second I'm just kind of I, I've gone over my threads again like I've been doing so I'm just gonna see if I can uh, unravel my threads a little bit and then I'll show you there we go got them unraveled now And the other thing, when you're sewing 100% cotton, you might have to make some fine adjustments as well on uh, that upper tension. It might be a little bit too much on the strong side, which is kind of what I'm seeing right now. Our top stitch is not as nicely defined as it could be, and that is a product of the upper tension being a little bit too strong. So we'll probably sew it again and back that off just a little bit. And I might also bump up our feed dog, our, our uh, presser foot pressure, just ever so slightly. Just ever so slightly. Yeah, we'll look at these first and see what we think. That's going to be our top stitch. Yep, that's our top stitch. And then our lock stitch is just on the other side. <clears throat> All right, so let's in, sometimes on this cotton, it's a little bit easier to see if I kind of show it to you this way from the side. So this is the way we'll look at it first. This again is our top stitch. It's a very good looking top stitch, but you no might notice some modest, very modest variation as far as the stitch length consistency. That can be a product, like right there in the middle of the screen, that can be a product of inadequate presser foot pressure. It's a very good looking stitch. All of them are very good looking stitches, but as we get a, just a, I mean, it's incredibly subtle, the variance between the stitch look uh, that can be an indication of the feed factor. So that's why I just bumped up the feed just ever so slightly. But all in all, I would give that a solid page 34 as far as just the overall beauty and the uh, integrity of that stitch. Come out, totality of the stitching, a little bit harder to see from this distance, but it really is a lovely stitch. And if if I go ahead and turn it over, we can look at that lock stitch, which I think you're going to agree is going to be just a little bit overly poppy. And that's where I think sewing this type of material, just backing off that upper tension just slightly, which I just did, is going to be the recipe for success for sewing this 100% cotton. Oh yeah, you can already see it. I'm just going to change the angle of it just slightly. There we go. 
So this again is gonna be our lock stitch, beautiful lock stitch, even from this distance you can see, it's absolutely spot on. The spacing, the integrity of the stitch, the clarity of the stitch is just absolutely bang on, but it's almost a little bit too much as far as the emphasis. It's a little too flashy. So I think what I just did and just very, very slightly backing off that upper tension so that it's not quite as poppy, I think is the right, right thing to do. But that is absolutely a page 34, if not a page 34 plus stitch on this 100% cotton. I don't even need to go past it again. You can see that very easily. But again, you can have a incredibly good looking stitch like this lock stitch, which is absolutely spot on, but look at it very carefully and you can see what I'm saying. It's just a little bit too pronounced. We'll kind of flip it, take a look at it now. That's our lock stitch. So I flip it back to the top stitch. You kind of can see what I'm saying as far as the contrast uh, between the poppiness of the two stitches. That is if I make it a little bit easier for you to see it. There we go. So still a very good looking stitch, but just a little bit on the weak side. A little bit on the weak side when it comes to the presentation. So, but again, we're not dealing with incredibly thick material here. We've got to get that knot between the top layer and the bottom layer centered between the two layers, but there's only so much thickness you're working with. So. Uh, all in all, I'm pleased with it, but again, we're committed to constant and never-ending improvement, so we're always trying to make things better, right? You veterans can explain to folks if they need to know, well, they do need to know, obviously, but you can explain to them what the Kanai Factor is. What, what is that all about? So I'm going to throw this to the back as a pass. I was thinking about stitching it one more time, but I think, I think we're close enough to that page 34 plus if not you know we're, we're, we're solid so we're going to stop here in this one because we have a lot more sauce to do throw that to the back with our elk hide and with our uh, saddle grade leather i'm going to wipe over my glasses again i wore my my reading glasses like these Almost the same color as Roz's machine, actually. Kind of see those from the side. Uh, for, for the premieres. But they get dirty. It's, it's really kind of a weird phenomenon. How do glasses get dirty when you're not even going anywhere or really doing anything? You're just sitting here. It's so weird, isn't it? It's one of those mysteries of life. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to get us set up for the first set of photos that I want to show you. And we'll change the camera shot over to there and then we'll come back to the machine and do more sewing. We've done elk hide, we've done uh, saddle grade leather and we've done now 100% cotton. So we'll take a look at some progress shots and then we'll kind of circle back from there. And there again is Umi proudly standing with this uh, machine that belongs to Roz. Really is a spectacular machine, isn't it? Again, the Japanese really do understand the concept of making something aesthetically pleasing, making it look, making it look very, very pretty so that the consumer looks at it. And it's kind of like eye candy. They look at it like eye candy and they go, wow, I would love to have a machine like that. I would love to have a machine like that. All right, let's take a look at that next picture. Well, here's the reality about things uh, that are eye candy based. In other words, you look at something, it's pretty, it catches your eye and you're like, wow, that's that's something I'd like to get. That's something I'd like to get because it's just so doggone pretty. If you base your buying decisions off of that, I'm going to shut a couple more lights off here. If you base your buying decisions off of that, you're in a potentially problematic state. 
because basing your decisions off of something that just looks pretty, you're going to be missing some of the critical things like the functionality of the machine and the readiness of the machine. And again, I talked about the Japanese machines being made from some of those sunken ships. Many of the Japanese machines were made because of the scarcity of metal. They were made from Japanese ships and the result is that over time that metal having been sitting in salt water for extended periods of time starts to allow that rust to come through the surface of that uh, lacquer and that clear coat and everything and this is what you get. I'm going to move to the other side real quick. So I always say buyer beware just because something that's pretty is also potentially going to be problematic so just realize that. So that's more of a distance shot just kind of showing you um, you know the beginning phases of this and uh, giving you an idea and an understanding of all the different elements of a project like this. So many different elements come into play from motor issues to electrical issues and they all potentially can impact the outcome of that project and, and also the amount of time that's spent on that project as well so a lot of things to weigh a lot of things to calculate there's Umi again just kind of She's very proud of the machines that came out of Japan, obviously. Very, very proud. And she should be. All right. I'm trying to multitask here. I'm doing something off camera as well at the same time. So here we've got a shot. You can just see, again see the ornamental nature of these machines. The Japanese really are attention to detail people. So the clarity and the beauty of the machine, the lines of the machine, especially on the Stitch Queen, they all just flow together beautifully. You know, you talk about the lines on cars in that and how, how prominent that is to the impression that people get about, you know, that automobile. The Japanese had the same concept for their sewing machines. There again is a really close shot of that uh, faceplate, and you can see straight away, again, the Japanese have put a great deal of attention to detail and really wanting that faceplate to be part of that eye candy, part of that uh, beauty of the machine. And again, not a lot of filigree and uh, decaling, but just enough to give the machine uh, a nice stylized look. And you can see how they've even copied Singer from the point of having the two marker points on either side of the filigree to kind of uh, frame in the branding of the Stitch Queen. Again, they, there was a lot of, lot of copying because we gave them the plans, so... That really is a beautiful color, and that really is a color that the Japanese love in their culture, that robin color blue. So there we're kind of looking at some of the controls. Uh, again, our feed dog drop, our stitch length control to the top for reverse, and then also part of our bobbin winding system as well. And there's that branding mark right there on the medallion, on the badge mark. And you can see they've come up with the name of H and J sewing machine company. H&J Sewing Machine Company is not a real company. It's just part of their branding uh, approach and their branding uh, theory in avoiding the objection for people that still had a bitterness in their mouth over the uh, World War II and, and Japanese conflict, etc., etc. So, 
where originally the original ones would say made in Japan, they totally eliminated that objection on this machine. There again is our feed dog drop. And again, it's really a smart design where you can graduate it down to get into the uh, silks and satin range right around one and two. Another shot of the machine. It really is a lovely machine, even from the beginning coming into the workshop, apart from mitigating all of the rust issues with it. <clears throat> there across the top you can see the Stitch, Stitch Queen Manufacturing Company. The Stitch Queen Manufacturing Company. So they really have the machine double branded. They've got it branded on the front with one name, H and J, and then they've got it branded on the top with another name. If that doesn't create enough confusion in the marketplace so that the average American consumer that's looking at this machine is so confused. Well, is it made by H&J or is it made by Stitch Queen Sewing Machine Company? They're like, okay, I'll just buy it because it's obviously, it's obviously not Japanese. As you can see, uh, Roz's motor had some major wiring issues. It was really a fire, fire waiting to happen. So a lot of work you'll see eventually in the progress shots that I had to do on Roz's motor uh, to get it safe to operate. And there's a close-up right there. You can see bare wires right at the bottom of the motor coming out the bottom. And again, as a motor is mounted, this is going to be on the bottom. It's going to be out of sight. So that's why it's always wise if you buy a machine, particularly a, a Japanese clone machine post-World War II, before you plug it in and try to hit that foot controller, do some basic inspection of that machine so that you know that it's safe to operate. And that's true of any machine, not just uh, post-World War II Japanese, Japanese machines, but all sewing machines for that matter that are vintage. You always want to do a general inspection to make sure that it's safe to operate. Okay? And the only reason I said initially, in particular Japanese clone machines, is because the type of wiring that they use, this colored decorative matching type uh, wire, wasn't really of the highest caliber sometimes. And that coating would have a greater tendency to become brittle and to break down. So there you can see more in the shot there, the bare wires, uh, really a fire hazard, uh, really a potential risk the Roz and that's why she was very wise to say even before I try plugging this machine in I'm gonna send it off to Scott at the workshop so he can make it right so Roz is a smart lady and that was definitely the right move to make on this on, in this instance very very brittle stuff they were looking in the faceplate area and you can look at all the mechanics Thoughtful engineering, again, modeled after the Singer Class 15 machine. Um, and it's ready to, you know, it's, you know, with some basic uh, servicing, conditioning, and cleaning, and rust mitigation, it's going to be a machine that we can bring to a point of being ready for a premiere uh, reasonably quick. And there's some of that rust that I'm talking about here, also on the uh, needle bar and the presser foot bar as well. So a fair amount of rust to mitigate and I also used a special neutralizing solution on the inside of the machine to try to deter that rust from continuing to make its presence known. But again you can see whenever you use metal that's been soaked in sea salt this is an inherent risk that you take. There's our presser foot bar with a spring. I make it a point of whenever I see any sign of any rust uh, beyond basic veneering I always take that assembly apart and take the spring off as well so I can go after the potential rust on that presser foot bar on the rear of the machine. So you can see combination of rust and veneering as well on these components of the machine as well.
And there, I, I wanted to get a 16 gauge wire that wasn't black. Black would have been functional and it would have been practical, but I wanted to try to, as best as I could, match the theme of the machine, which is that robin blue color, beautiful robin blue color, and then also that yellow filigree. It's kind of a, a yellowish filigree, and that's part of the reason, again, I picked the uh, trilobal yellow thread today, is I wanted to kind of just make the make a complete ensemble so when I was looking at options I had as far as rewiring the machine I didn't have a yellow uh, 16 gauge type uh, wire so I went with more of a off yellow translucent type uh, wiring which I think worked out in the end very very nicely but I try to be very thoughtful about the customers needs when I'm doing work on the machines I want to make the machine obviously safe and functional but I also want to be sensitive to completing the ensemble theme of the machine as well as I'm trying to clean these glasses again which have gotten dirty for no apparent reason so so here I'm beginning the wiring process I'm trying to get that wire for this plug-in junction ready to be plugged into the uh, the block and uh, you know getting that in entire assembly set up uh, this particular type of a plug-in uh, requires that you do not strip the wires I've got my my stripper right here for one end of the wire but the end that plugs into here there's actually going to be some very very sharp uh, metal prongs that are, are part of this assembly where you have to very carefully press the the wire into those prongs and then they pierce the outer coating and then they go right in and make contact with the inside copper wire so it's a different way of setting it up on this end than on this end so now we're going after the motor we're going to have to disassemble the motor to get on the inside of the motor so we can um, add our new wiring to that. And that will require some soldering as well. So again, some of these repairs are a little bit more complicated than the average uh, sewing machine enthusiast might want to take on. They're a little bit tricky. So just know your limitations, okay? So here we're starting to disassemble the motor so we can get into the inside of the motor to do the wiring that we need to do. You see we have that motor cracked open now. We're going to be able to get in there and do what we need to do. Because we definitely don't want it to stay like that. That bare wiring was incredibly dangerous on uh, Roz's machine. Also, you can see the plastic uh, retainer that was designed to keep that wiring from touching the metal casing of the motor cover has also uh, been compromised as well, so that that bare wire was actually touching the metal casing of the motor, which is incredibly dangerous. So I'm slowly but surely working my way on the inside so we can address the wiring issue. You can see we've separated the two halves of the motor, which will also allow us to do our optimizing and servicing the motor much easier. So again here, you can see where the old wires are connected to our electrical field here and there. We've got to get rid of the old to make way for the new. How often have you heard that phrase? Or that phrase? So when it comes to rewiring a motor, you can't leave the old wiring in place because it's dangerous to do that, but it's also going to reduce the electricity flow to the new wiring. So we've got to use a superheating process to remove the old wires that are soldered on to those connection points right now. And that's going to require a soldering iron that's going to be a little bit over 400 degrees. 
that's where I say know your limitations so that you don't take on too much and also potentially hurt, your, hurt yourself as well. So the first phase that I use to soften that solder up before I try to use a soldering iron is I use my torch, which is again is going to be right around 1,000 to 1,200 degrees. Very, very potentially dangerous when you're dealing in close proximity right there to the, uh, the stator wraps of the motor, which uh, can be damaged very easily. Now after softening up that solder a little bit, I'm going in there with my soldering iron, which is going to be again around 400 degrees, and because it's very close quarter working and I don't want to damage any of the, uh, the, the, um, any of the copper contacts in those areas, I'm using my magnifiers as well so I can see very closely what I'm doing. So again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to break away those old wires that are damaged from the connection points on the inside of the motor, and then we're going to be reapplying new wiring to those uh, using a combination of solder and then also uh, some, some solvents to, uh, to make that stick better. And obviously, Umi is keeping a close eye on things, right? So I think we've gone full circle now. Yep, we have. So in this next set of photos we'll look at, after we do some more sewing with Roz's machine, uh, you'll just see more phases of getting that motor back to the point that it needs to be so that it's going to be optimized, it's going to be fully functional, and it's going to be safe as well for, for Roz to operate it. Alright, let's get some lights back on and get back to this fabulous machine. Oh, I wanted to offer you guys something too. I almost forgot. You know, during premieres, I like to do impromptu things sometimes just because it's fun, right? So I've come across something which I think is kind of neat, and I only have a limited number of them. But I know everybody is conscious right now, even though we're kind of post pandemic, now they're looking at some resurgence of that as well. So people are becoming, again, sensitive about touching surfaces that others may have touched. Or let's say you go in for a general service in your sewing center, uh, your repair center in your neck of the woods, because it's just a real basic service that you're looking for, not one of my surgical services that goes deep into the machine. You know, you're just happy with mediocrity. You don't want excellence. <laughs> So I'm kind of giving you a hard time because obviously my service of machine, my service of a machine that's about 12 to 14 hours is light years beyond what a local service center will do for you. But let's just say you decide to bite the bullet and say, I know they're going to do a crummy job to some extent, but I'm just going to get it done. And then you get your machine back and you're sensitive about, okay, somebody's been touching my machine all over the place and you're wanting to neutralize that risk, that threat, right? So how do you do that? Well, you don't want to wipe the machine down with bleach because you'll destroy your machine. You don't want to use other cleaning solvents because that's too caustic and it's going to damage the clear coat and the finish of your machine. So you use a little device like this and it's designed to kill 99.9% .9 of harmful, harmful viruses, germs, and bacteria and uh, this one is a real compact version you can carry it in your wallet in your purse in your fanny pack 
You pretty much put it almost anywhere. Look at all the bad things it kills right there. Things that can make you sick, like the coronavirus. And this even will uh, uh, kill, uh, what is it, uh, E. coli? It'll kill that as well and more. So, at any rate, it's a neat little, it's a neat little gadget. And to the first three people that send me a text right now, and you have to text your name, your address, I'll mail the first three people that text me one of these. And the phone number, I'll type it in the chat, but it's also, I'll give it to you right now, 920-454-0393. And this is battery operated, so you don't need to plug it in. You just take it anywhere you want. If you're out at a restaurant, you can wand over the areas that you're concerned about touching. And again, it'll kill all of those harmful uh, viruses, bacteria, everything else. And then uh, once you need to replace the batteries in it, you can just swap out the batteries and keep on using it. They also show you can use it on keyboards as well. And it uses a special, special ultraviolet-like light, I think, as far as killing the stuff. But it's been lab tested and it's proven, so it's not some fake gadget like you'll see sometimes. So again, the number you want to text is 920-454-0393. And again, I'll mail one of these out to the first three people that do that. Okay? Cool. Everybody likes free stuff, right? And it's, I mean, how hard is it to send a text, right? That was easy. Yeah, that was easy. Exactly. That was easy. Yeah, and you just got something free out of it too, which is super cool. Yeah. And yes, batteries Batteries are included, at least for me. I'll, I'll give you the triple A's that are needed to operate that thing. So, yeah. All right. So let's zoom in on the needle and keep on marching forward here. So again, if you joined us late... The setup we have is 40 weight trilobal embroidery thread on top. And then we're using a size 90 universal needle by Schmetz. And, uh, you know, generally this works pretty well for most of the sewing sew offs we're going to be doing. So uh, the next sew off we're going to do now is going to be the 100% polyester, the ribbon material. So let's get this set up to do this next sew off. Again, we made a subtle adjustment on presser foot pressure. We bumped it up just a little bit from when we did the 100% cotton. And uh, we also backed off our upper tension a little bit. But I know from experience the polyester isn't quite as sensitive as the 100% cotton, so I'm going to adjust my upper tension up to where it was originally, which is right around right around four and a half. Right around four and a half is where we're at right now. So all right, take up arm at the highest position. Let's go ahead and give this so off a try on the light side, 100% polyester. All right, here we go. Threads a clip. Let's take a look at these stitches. Wow, I can already tell you they are looking fabulous. Beautiful, beautiful stitching. Wow, wow. 
Let me get our thread, our, our sew-off holder. I guess I could call it a thread holder because on the sew-off there's thread, but yeah. All right, let's take a look at this. This is going to be our top stitch, and then we'll flip it over and take a look at that lock stitch. Well, we're kind of at totality of stitching right now, aren't we? And you can see right now that that is a absolutely, what do people, what do the young people say? That's a sick stitch. That's a super sick stitch. It looks really, really good. Let's zoom in and take a closer look. This again is going to be our top stitch. And you can see straight away, based on how those stitches are presenting, as far as the, uh, the, the caliber of the stitch, the quality of the stitch, the clarity of the stitch, we've got a very good balance right now on presser foot pressure. Again, we're not at max because we're sewing on the lighter side right now. And um, we're set on maximum stitch length. And that is bang on as far as six stitches per inch. Not to mention the clarity and the, the presentation of the stitch is just spot on. Beautiful stitching. And again, 100% polyester, that is not easy for a machine to sew. And yet Roz's machine just made it look like it was a hiccup. All I can say is wow. Absolutely spectacular. Spectacular top stitch. I'm going to give that a solid, a solid uh, page 34 plus. And I'm going to get a drink of water because I need it. <clears throat> and while I'm reaching for the water, I'm also going to flip this around so we can start to get a glimpse of that lock stitch. Once I can get it to set on there, there we go. <clears throat> Nothing like a little bit of water. <clears throat> well, even from this point right here, with what I would call totality of the stitching, it's kind of quasi-totality as we were zoomed in a little bit closer, but that is an absolutely drop-dead gorgeous lock stitch. Let's, let's zoom in and take a closer look and see what we think. Absolutely spot on. Unbelievably beautiful. Isn't that a gorgeous stitch? Absolutely phenomenal! Unbelievable. That is a solid page 34 plus as well. And again, 100% polyester is not going to be a real easy material to sew when it comes to managing that uh, you know that that tension balance but when you got music like this it's a breeze yeah it is well what can I say absolutely spot-on stitching right I would like to sew this one more time because it is an incredibly tricky material, but this time I'd like to back down that stitch length to about 10 to 12 stitches per inch. Not super teeny tiny, but a little bit smaller than we are now. So let's do that. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust our stitch length right now so that we're going to go a little bit on the shorter side. <clears throat> I'm 
let's see, right around to there. So we're right around 10, 10 to 12 stitches per inch, right about there. So let's go back over towards the needle and see what that translates to with 100% polyester, okay? All right, here we go. We're not gonna be quite in the satin range, but we're gonna be heading that direction. So here we go. Oh yeah, holy mackerel. Boy, does that look different. Boy, does that look different. You know, what is up with me with sewing over the thread? just have a habit of sewing over the thread. See that what I did right there? And it's easy enough, to, generally it's easy enough to fix when you goof up like that. And I know all of you have done it too, so. See, that was pretty easy to fix, but it's like, dunk on it. All right. my stitch off holder and we'll take a look at these again. <clears throat> so again our top row is going to be the first stitch off that we did. The second row is going to be the second one we did when we adjusted that stitch length down to right around 10 to 12 stitches per inch. Just gonna adjust that a little bit more. And you can see right there, as we launch into looking at this, you can see the dramatic difference uh, between the two. And yet the clarity of stitching on both is uh, equally page 34, if not page 34 plus. Let's go and go across and look at the two of them together. Absolutely spectacular stitching. We've already seen that top row, but we're seeing it again now in contrast to that second row that we just did adjusting that stitch length way down. We could obviously go lower than that, but we're not going to. I'll leave this space open for Ross to sew it. Pause right there. Pause right there. Folks, I'll come out on totality of stitching too. Let's see, write it right around to there. Folks, that is exactly what we're looking for. That is exactly what we want when it comes to stitch quality, stitch caliber. It's absolutely spot on. Absolutely spot on. And, and that's what we would expect after it goes through my rigorous process on the workbench, right? It's not a dainty, delicate little approach. I dig deep into the machines. 
and the result is evidence when you're doing a tricky sew off like this with 100% polyester and the stitch quality and the caliber between both of those rows at different stitch lengths on a very slippery tricky material is just absolutely spot on. Flip it over and look at that lock stitch. What are we going to see? Anything dramatic? No, we're just going to see page 34. Page 34 with the top row, we've already seen that. And uh, page 34 with the bottom row. Or page 34 plus. And here you can see we, we've we got a little bit of a... See where those the, the, the whole space is between the stitch row on the bottom? You can almost see the, the hole is a, a little bit uh, over-pronounced. That's an indication that our upper tension might be pulling a little bit too hard. So this is again where when you get into the lighter materials, the 100% polyester, uh, when you get into the 100% cottons and the, uh, the silks, the satins, you might need to back off that upper tension more than you normally would. You still have a beautiful stitch both the top row and the bottom row, but as it starts to pull too hard, it actually elongates that space between the stitches and makes that hole a little bit more pronounced. That's an indication of upper tension needs to be backed off a little bit, just a little bit. But we are on a solid page 34, without a doubt. Absolutely spectacular. We've already looked at totality, but we'll go to totality again and just kind of show you that. Folks, that's an absolute pass, and I'm going to throw it to the back. Building our sew-off sandwiches, which is starting to grow more and more and more. So Amazing! Raj, you've got a peach of a machine here. You really do. And she's a happy girl now that she's gone through the workshop. Plus, she doesn't have rust anymore. Yay! Rust is not our friend. Dirt is not our friend. Well, if we keep eliminating things, we're not going to have any friends at all. All right. Let's go to the next sew-off. So again, the goal of premieres is not to show the absolute strength of a machine. That's not the goal at all. You're going to see the machine flex for sure. You're going to see it demonstrate its muscle going through very difficult sew-offs, but that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to show the versatility, the strength of the machine, and the readiness of the machine, meaning that it's ready to get the job done. Just like right now, as we're getting ready to go away from the light side, and we're going to be going back to saddle grade leather, but in this case, we're not going to be sewing a single layer. We're going to be sewing two layers of this saddle grade leather. And again, as you look at it, it's going to be a little bit thinner as far as overall thickness than that uh, genuine elk hide. But because of the composition of this saddle grade leather, it's going to be as, as difficult, if not more difficult from a piercing standpoint than that elk hide was. Again, that elk hide, if you look at it side by side, matter of fact, let's do that. You look at these two side by side, that elk hide is clearly thicker than this saddle grade leather. But again, leathers are different as far as their piercing threshold because of the way they're made. So this saddle grade leather is definitely gonna be an adequate test to this Japanese clone machine. Matter of fact, you know what? I'm gonna push the limit a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna sew down this saddle grade leather and do two layers, and then we might add an additional layer. We might do three layers. I don't know if I've ever done three layers of saddle grade leather before. I don't know that I have. I don't think I have. Pretty sure I haven't. 
So I'm gonna get this other, I get this other piece of saddle grade leather ready just in case we decide to add that extra layer. It's crazy, but you know, you expect that on this channel, you just do. You expect a little crazy on this channel because it's fun. So I've got my third layer ready if I decide to tackle it. We decide to take it on, we're ready. We are ready. We have to get through two layers first, right? One step at a time, Scott. One step at a time. One step at a time, buddy. All right, here we go. Two layers of saddle grade leather. I'm a little, I'll be honest. Oh, and you know what? I almost forgot to adjust our stitch length back. We were still, still on 12. That would have been interesting, huh? That would have been super, super interesting. All right. Two layers of saddle grade leather. Here we go. Yikos. Yikos Tycos. That's a little freaky. That is a little bit freaky. Yes, it is. But you notice there was no hesitation on the the uh, on the launch at all. Raz's machine just jumped into it and made it happen. It just made it happen. Let's take a look at these stitches, and then we'll decide if we're going to add our third layer of saddle grade leather. Let's take a look at these. Top stitch first. Oh, you can already see them. Again, two layers of saddle grade leather. Let's zoom in straight away and look at this. Pause right there. I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say it and get a drink of water too. <clears throat> that was easy. That was easy. Two layers of saddle grade leather. And that was easy, absolutely. Let's go across and look at these. Unbelievable. Holy mackerel. Let's flip it over and look at the lock stitch. I don't know how to improve on that. It's a solid page 34 plus. Could we make it better? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm committed to making it better, but I don't know how I can make it better than it is right now. Let's turn over and look at that lock stitch. And again, even though this is not a heavy nap leather, like say an Italian leather or a genuine cowhide, it's going to mask that stitching just a wee bit because of the nap. But look at those stitches, even in this initial glimpse. Folks, that is solid page 34 plus. It's solid page 34 plus. It just is. And again, we're talking two layers of saddle grade leather, folks. This is not easy peasy stuff at all. It's super tough. And yet this Japanese clone machine, this Stitch Queen, just demonstrated its royalty and its, its dominance over this saddle grade leather. There are a number of vintage machines, folks, that could not sew a single layer of this. And Roz's machine just buzzed through two layers like it was, like it was, it was candy corn. I mean, not that we've ever sewn candy corn. I'll add that to my list of possibilities. But totality of the stitching as well on this lock stitch through two layers of saddle grade leather. The cat's meow. The cat's meow. So, should we try three? Maybe it's too much. Maybe it's not. And the other thing I'm going to do to make it even easier is I'm going to put this third layer 
back to back. We're going to go back to back. So this is what we're looking at now. Where's my camera shot right now? Yeah, you can see it. That's what we're looking at right now with three layers of saddle grade leather. I'm almost thinking this is too much. Not that the machine can't get through it. It can. After I got done with that motor work, are you kidding me? We could sew patio blocks, but it's not just sewing and getting through it. It's also laying down a page 34 stitch. So we're going to give it a try and see if we can nail a page 34 stitch or maybe even a page 34 plus stitch. But again, I've done a lot of sewing on this needle already. So we're going to see. We're going to see what we get and not throw a fit. And yeah, I'm a little bit nervous because I did not, I did not test this. I did not test this off camera. I did two layers. I did not do three. I did not do three. Oh my gosh. Folks, look at that from the side. Look at that from the side. Okay, now I'm really nervous. But nervous in a good way. Nervous and excited to get this done. Not nervous that the machine can't do it. We're going to aim for a page 34 stitch through three layers of saddle grade leather. Remember, we're using a non-leather needle. We're using a universal Schmetz size 90, which equates to a size 14 needle. It's not a big harpoon needle, as Sonny calls them. It's not. It's a medium gauge needle. And it's not designed specifically for leather. It's supposed to be able to handle leather, but not leather at this level. Three layers of saddle grade leather, no way. No way. Yeah, we're gonna try it anyway. We absolutely are. And did I also mention and remind you that we're not sewing with a heavier weight type thread? We're sewing with basically a 40 weight embroidery thread. We're sewing with embroidery thread, folks, and a non-leather needle through three layers of saddle grade leather, about 12 to 14 ounces of leather. I'm getting so excited, I'm bumping the camera. Look at that. It's an earthquake. <laughs> That's actually my heartbeat right now. That's my heartbeat. Yeah, yeah, it is. We're going to give it a try, folks, because we don't know if we don't try, right? And I've got a lot of confidence in my machines. I've got a lot of confidence, but can we can we nail that page 34 stitch? Can we do it? We'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see. Yes, we will. All right, let's see what we get here. Here we go. Easy, boy, easy. Jiminy crickets. Like I said, this queen doesn't mess around. She just jumps into it and goes, I got this. I got this, Scott. I got this. Oh, my goodness gravy. Oh, my goodness gravy. If you could see what I'm seeing right now, other than the fact that I cut one of my own stitches, that's, that's beside the point. These clippers are just becoming rogue. They're rogue clippers. I'm going to leave these one threads a little bit longer so we can see which ones we just did. Although it'll be pretty evident by the fact that on the back side where the lock stitch is, there's only going to be one stitch row, right? Duh. Duh. All right. Oh my gosh. Wow. So the second stitch row is going to be the top row we're going to look at first, but let me first of all show you the thickness of what we just went through again. Three layers of saddle grade leather. Leather. I don't know that I've ever done that before, because I've only had this saddle grade leather for a short time since Maddie uh, sent it to me. Oh my gosh. So the bottom row is the first row we did. The top row is the second row we did going through three layers of saddle grade leather. We did the first sew off two layers of saddle grade leather, and then we added that third layer and we put it back to back so we could really see that stitch definition. I am just blown away. I'm blown away! But then again, I did a lot of work on the motor. I did a lot of work on that motor. Oh my gosh. 
top row is the second row through two layers, three layers, excuse me, three layers of saddle grade leather. Unbelievable. I mean, it's believable because you just saw it. Oh my gosh. Is there something above a page 34 plus? We could call it a snoz wanger or vernicious canid, like Willy Wonka might. Folks, I'm not even, even going to go by again. We'll just come out to here. Totality of the stitching. Again, the bottom row is with two layers of saddle grade leather. The top row is with three layers of saddle grade leather. Now the trick will be, what does that lock stitch look like on the other side? Considering, again, we're sewing with a non-leather needle and we're sewing with embroidery thread. Let's turn it over and take a look. Let's turn it over and take a look. But before I do that, I'm going to lean it towards you again just to show you what three layers of saddle grade leather looks like. Folks, that's a new level of crazy. Let's turn it around and look at that lock stitch now. And there's only going to be one row of stitching because, well, you know, because we just added that third layer of saddle grade leather. Oh my gosh. We are already at page 34, leaning towards page 34 plus, and now I'm looking for something above page 34 plus because when you sew at this difficulty level and you lay down stitching like that through three layers of saddle grade leather folks I don't even know if page 34 plus is enough we're gonna come up with something new above, above page 34 plus do we start adding pluses to it is this now a page 34 plus plus stitch off I don't know type it in the chat if you've got a strong opinion about what we should consider as a third threshold of stitching quality now. You know, page 34 is phenomenal. It's near perfect. Then we go to page 34 plus. What's after that? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Holy Mastacholi. Holy wing doodle. Wow. Totality of the stitching. Folks, page 34 without a doubt. Page 34 plus without a doubt. Maybe even better than that. Unbelievable. I don't believe I've... Y'all can tell me. You can be my fact checkers. Have I ever sewed three layers of saddle grade leather before? I don't think so. I think we've only done two. Now we've set a new standard with Raza's machine. Three layers of saddle grade leather. It's going to the back as a, wow, you think it passed? Yeah. So again, a new standard of stitch quality that is off, absolutely off the charts, off the charts. That is so cool. That is so cool to set new standards, isn't it? But it goes back to our Kanai principle, doesn't it? Constant and never-ending improvement. We're always trying to raise the bar. We're always trying to do something just a little bit above and beyond what we've done before. Well, what we're gonna do right now is decide what we're gonna sew next, but we're not gonna sew it right now. We're gonna go to that last set of photos on Facebook. So what should we sew next? I think what we'll sew next is some of this commercial upholstery material. So I'm going to fold it in half, get us up to two layers. I'm going to fold it in the middle to get us up to four layers and then fold it one more time to get us all the way up to six layers of commercial upholstery material. That'll be our next sew off. So let me try to get that into position. I might have to use the hyper extension because this is some thick, 
thick stuff. All right, press your foot is down. Well, you can see that from the side already. What we're going to be attempting next. I think you can. Yeah, I could have even faced it the other way. Then you could see it even better. Why don't I do that? I want to make this relevant so you can kind of get an appreciation for what we're trying to take on here. Let's face it this way. There we go. Now you can see it from the side and you can really get an appreciation for the thickness of what six layers of commercial upholstery material looks like. But you're only going to be able to look at it for a little bit and then we're going to go over to Facebook. Yeah, we are. Okay, change the camera shot. Shut the light off. I'll shut the other lights off too because you can see that reflection of my vest. See my vest? Again, I finished this vest using Roz's machine, so you see my little buttons there? Ooh, button, button, everybody button, button. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I might almost leave it like that, but that's really distracting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So we'll shut these off, and that should help, hopefully. Yeah, that helps quite a bit. So this opening shot tells a story, doesn't it? It tells you that you can get third degree burns at just, uh, I mean, like 100, 110 to 120 degrees. And we're dealing with heat here that is, that's actually the lower side of it, and a little bit over 400 degrees when you're dealing with a soldering iron. And the torch is way off the chart, so we don't even go there. But know your limitations, because when you're dealing with heat like this, you can get a very serious burn in just a matter of seconds. So here I'm working very, very carefully. And again, you have to work carefully when you're in the inside of the motor because the copper is so soft. And when you're exposing it to extreme heat, you can damage it or you can mar it. So you gotta be careful. Plus you've got the stator there as well, which is wrapped with an insulation, which can be damaged as well. So you just have to be real careful. Not to mention if you expose the copper wire itself that you're trying to uh, attach to the motor, if you expose it too long for an extended period of time to extreme heat, you know, in the hundreds of, hundreds of degrees when you're dealing with a soldering iron, you'll actually weaken that copper as well. And then that wire could break once you put that motor back together and it could be a, a it could be a safety issue. So you gotta you gotta manage that heat very, very carefully. So here again I'm looking at some of the old wiring, I'm looking at some of the new wiring. And I'm working through it very carefully to get those new wires attached. That's some of the old wiring again right there. You can, you can tell that it's obviously not safe. Definitely not safe to be using. You can see my vest again. Depending on the lighting, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I'll unplug that one too. Does that help? Yeah, you can just barely see my vest now, so. So type in the chat, are any of you really gun shy of doing wiring, like wiring motors and stuff? You can admit it publicly, you're among friends, you're, you're, you're in a special exclusive classroom where we know our limitations. So uh, if you're brave enough to admit that, I will totally respect that. Just say, I, I am not going to rewire a motor, I am not going to deal with a soldering iron, I'm not going to, definitely not going to mess around with a torch to soften up that solder so it can be removed. So if you're brave enough to say that, I, I'm impressed. 
So not only is the machine body itself made out of some of that metal that was in all likelihood submerged in salty water post-World War II, but also the casing for the motor as well, which is made out of metal, obviously. And there you can see more of that rust that I had to mitigate. Closer shot of it there as well. And rust is insidious. You can't leave it and just say, behave, don't go any further. If you don't mitigate and halt the rust where it's at, it's going to continue with the slightest bit of moisture, which any household will have, uh, to propagate itself. So you got to stop it, eliminate it, eradicate it. So I go through many, many phases to do that. How does that look? That's that's the after. I don't think there's a picture after that, is there? No. So that, this is the before. Actually, this is the before. That's the after. Night and day, right? And again, if you go to a local service center, if you decide to bite the bullet and say, I don't want to ship the machine all the way to Scott. I don't want excellence. I want mediocrity. See, Roz, I'll just tell you up front, Roz and Paula and Emma and Maddie and Sonny and Mindy and Mary, and the list could go on and on and on and on and on of our veterans that are regular attenders at these premieres. They are ladies of excellence. They are not going to settle for mediocrity, which is why all of them have sent machines some of them multiple machines to the workshop. So don't be happy with mediocrity. Go for excellence. The difference in price is modest when you compare it to 45 minutes to an hour on the workbench of your service center to 14 hours on the workbench here at the workshop. Not to mention the level, level that I dig into the machine is light years beyond. It's light years beyond, as evidenced right here. If that motor runs, guess what? They're not going to do a thing to that motor. And all the things that I've done, the Roz's motor, I mean, you just saw it. It went through elk hide and saddle grade leather like it was a hot knife through butter. All the activity on the workbench there, combination of optimizing the motor, verifying it, checking for uh, safety of other connections within the motor as well, multiple phases of optimizing that motor before it's put back together and deemed to be safe and uh, ready to get the job done. Some of, the, some of our new wires uh, that we're going to be now very, very carefully attaching to uh, Roz's motor. Yeah, that wasn't perfect. That was that was scary. So here you're seeing me actually solder these wires onto those inside mounting points on the motor after I went through very carefully and meticulously to remove the old wires that were soldered to those contact points. And again, the old soldering has to be removed as well because it becomes brittle over time. And some of the original type solders they used are not nearly as good as the ones we have now. So I have to also strip all of that old soldering off as well and again the mounting points are very thin uh, copper so you've got to manage that heat very very carefully so there I've got one of my weights out and I'm actually using it to uh, balance that motor while I'm doing some additional work to it and what I'm doing here now is I'm when you're applying solder, you don't gunk it on in a huge glob. You go layer by layer to build it up. And I, I have to do that by measuring the temperature so that that heat is wicked off of there before I put my next layer on. Otherwise, it doesn't adhere as well. So we're getting down to right around 80 degrees. And then I'll finish off the soldering on those points. And also, like I always do, I always seal off my connections, so I'm applying a special 
heat resistant and oil resistant uh, epoxy to seal off those connections once they've been soldered in place. Now we're getting real close. We've got a motor that's going to run like a jet engine and we also have a motor that's going to be safe. And I don't take pictures of everything so I'm going through here I'm, I'm uh, optimizing and uh, cleaning the stators, the commutators, the stack lamentations, all the different critical components of the motor that are part of that extended electrical field have to be optimized. Otherwise the motor is not going to be at peak performance. More cleaning, more optimizing. Look at how filthy that commutator is right now. And again, you've got to be real careful cleaning any of these electrical contact areas and components that are made of copper. Copper is a very soft metal. Getting close. Oh yeah. Before, look at right in here. After. After. Unbelievably different when it comes to what the workshop does compared to what you'll get anywhere else. Anywhere else. I would put my service approach, which continues to be improved, and it's nearly perfect. He's saying perfect. I don't know if I'd go perfect, but it's real close. More servicing of the motor. There's 30 plus service points on a motor, not even including the repairs that we just did. Verifying carbon stacks as well. Confirming uh, motor brushes, cleaning motor brushes. And beyond all of that, I still, because there's certain areas I can't reach with my dental tools and other tools that I use, and so I always flush the motor after going through and detail cleaning it. And there's always time for a bubblegum break, you know what I mean? There just has to be. Even Umi chews gum. I mean, she does it like a lady, doesn't chew it like a, you know, like cud. Busy, busy workbench. And Umi loves these machines, just like Roz loves this machine, so she's always present, you know, checking things out and being there for support and encouragement. Here we've got a very happy motor, a motor that is ready to be reattached to the machine and get the job done. And again, when you're taking brackets off of motors and that, just make sure you mark those points in the beginning so that you can get it calibrated and set up correctly so the alignment of that belt running over the balance wheel and coming off of that output pulley on the motor are perfectly aligned otherwise you're going to be prematurely wearing the belt and you're going to be creating drag and causing that motor to run a lot harder than it needs to run so And also I, I like to add um, this shrink material as well to reinforce that wire where it's going to be at high flex points on the motor uh, so that that wire isn't stressed and it doesn't prematurely break or get damaged. So that's what I'm adding here is some of that stretch material. And it also adds a nice insulation to the material as well. And again, you use a, you use a hair dryer to heat this stuff so that it sucks onto that uh, wire and creates extra insulation and extra stability. And then instead of that broken plastic piece which was allowing that bare wire to ground against the metal casing, I use a special uh, epoxy again to seal off that opening to make that uh, wire rigid so that it's not, not able to have any contact even if it's coated uh, with the metal casing of the motor. I'm always driven, always driven by safety. For my customers. <clears throat> and 
here you can see Umi is uh, is not a shy girl and not afraid to get her hands dirty. She's grabbed one of those Q-tips with some of that insulating material and she's like, um, I want to help too. I want to help too. So she is, which is awesome. She's definitely not like Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean is a supervisor, doesn't get his hands dirty. And there's a proper seal there for that wire so that it's going to be on the bottom of the motor. It's going to be out of sight, out of mind, but it's going to be safe and it's going to be secure. Even if that wire is pulled a little bit, that is going to create a buffer so that those contacts inside are secure. Nothing's going to come loose. Nothing's going to get broken. <clears throat> Busy workbench. Getting towards the final phases of that motor work. A lot of work on the motor. No idea what that is. Oh, it's a distance shot showing you uh, the workbench from a distance. I think that's what it's showing. So I've got two work workbenches here. I've got this workbench, that workbench, and then all that is workspace. Focusing on the side of the machine now, we're going to be looking at the main shaft, I think. Also cleaning the body of the machine up a little bit. Ah, I stand corrected. They tucked it away on the back of the machine where the motor will cover it. So with that motor on, and, and the average, let's just face it, the average owner of a Japanese clone machine is not highly likely to be removing the motor unless it's way down the road and they're replacing the belt and they'll probably have somebody else replace the belt. So the Japanese on the back of the pillar very discreetly put made in Japan, which is covered by the motor. So that's cool. Here again, we're looking at more rust. And this is part of the balance wheel. Combination of varnishing and, and rust. Inside as well, see that? It's all rust. And this is again, just the, the type of metal that they use to, to manufacture the machines it has this greater propensity uh, for rusting. systematically getting that off the machine and again it's a combination of, uh, of working it off and then also conditioning that metal so that that rust is not going to return <clears throat> main shaft work as well a lot of cleaning a lot of deep deep cleaning placing that bobbin winding tire sadly I could not find a Robin's blue bobbin winding tire. I searched everywhere and they're simply not available so we had to go with a traditional black bobbin winding tire. I even tried painting one but it just doesn't work when you're dealing with a rubbery material so. More cleaning. More detail cleaning. Dealing with more rust and more varnishing on the inside of that stop action clutch. Clutch retainer was also had rust on it, also dealing with that as well. Now we're inside of the foot controller, which also needed to be optimized as well. See that one wire that's come loose? And also we've got varnishing buildup on there as well. People seldom think of servicing the foot controller, but it is so critical because it has interplay with what other component of the machine. Type it in the chat. What other component of the machine does the foot controller have constant interplay with? And if you optimize one, but you don't optimize the other, you sacrifice performance and safety too. Slowly working at cleaning that foot controller up and getting it safe. getting really close here. We're going to be servicing the faceplate. We're also getting really close to the final phases. Here I'm using a, um, a, a soft mallet to do a little bit of adjustments on the machine. 
And the adjustments on this one specifically was the height of the presser foot bar. It was off by about three millimeters. It also gives me an opportunity by re removing that spring to do deep cleaning on that presser foot bar as well because there was varnishing and there was rust on that as well. And it's kind of concealed by the spring. Tearing down that upper tension completely so I know it's going to be functioning exactly as it should. You can't just swap be between the discs. That is a myth constantly propagated on Facebook and groups, and it's absolutely false. That's how far you got to go if you want to have the machine fully optimized. And sewing page 34, like you've seen it today, on light materials, on crazy thick, ridiculous materials, and everything else. Here making some adjustments because that spring had been stretched at some point and it had to be compressed back. And that's only done very carefully with uh, vice grips and with needle nose and with heat as well so that it will conform back to its original shape. More detail cleaning. More detail cleaning. There we go, there we go. Now we're getting close. No idea who that is. And I think we're back to the beginning. Yeah, I think we are. Yeah, we've gone full circle. And there were probably another 100 plus photos that I could have included, but I didn't. Uh, because documenting the process is, is something important that I want to do for you to give you some insight into the depth of the service and repairs that I do. But it's also time consuming to stop and to, you know, to line it up and to get the shot and then to resume the work again. So I only go so far. Otherwise, my 12 to 14 hour service would be 20 to 25 hours. So, but you get a good glimpse of it, don't you? You get a real good glimpse. So you have a deeper understanding of how different my process is, right? That's really what I'm, that's what I'm aiming for. All right, so let's get down to the uh, needle now and let's see if we can tackle this commercial grade upholstery material, six layers of it, thicker than an upholsterer would generally be sewing. And obviously off camera, I bumped up the, uh, Presser foot pressure, and we're going to be trying to buzz down, and I'll leave the other side for Roz to buzz down so she can have fun with this as well. All right, so here we go. Six layers of commercial upholstery material. Wow. Wow! It's like sewing a phone book, folks. It just is. It's like sewing a phone book. And you, if you didn't notice, uh, a couple of the times when I would sew over my own thread and I had to kind of go through that cleanup process, it's because I was forgetting one of the most basic rules about most Class 15s, but particularly the Class 15s made in Japan, is because of that oscillating hook system and the way it advances that thread, holding on to the tails of the thread when you're initially launching is a necessary evil. You got to do it. And I was trying to do it without doing that. You know, being the confident expert, world class uh, aficionado of sewing machines, I thought, well, I don't need to do that. Well, you really do. And it eliminates a major headache. Of that throat of that thread being misfed and sewn over as you're going through the sewing process. So all of that blah blah blahing is don't get lazy like me, okay? Don't get lazy like me. I'll turn it like this. This is our top stitch. We'll look at this first and then we'll turn it around and look at again from the side what we just sewed through. 
six layers of commercial upholstery material, a new level of, are you kidding me? Yeah, it is. Now, we may have gone through all of our songs. We did. So now I'm going to type in another keyword, like, eh, what should I type in? Guitar? Let's try guitar. And we'll play this a little bit. Turn it way back. Guitar. Yeah. So six layers of commercial upholstery material. Let's look at these stitches, see what we think on Roz's post-World War II Japanese clone machine. Just look at that stuff. I mean, it looks like it, it's part of a bulletproof vest, doesn't it? You can just see the woven nature of this material. And that's where if you were sewing a ton of this stuff, you'd either want to be using a needle that was designed for woven materials, or you might be able to get away with certain leather needles. We'll also cut through that. Uh, but we're using a universal needle, a Schmetz size 9014, and yet we're still laying down page 34, page 34 plus stitching. You can see it right there. It's as clear as day. Pause. Unbelievable. I mean, you just look at that material and you go, holy, did we really just go through six layers of that? We did. We did with Roz's machine and we laid down page 34 plus stitching. That's our top stitch. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Total, totality of the stitching, we'll go to right about there, is absolutely spot on. It just doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't. Let's turn over and look at the lock stitch. Lock stitch through six layers of commercial upholstery material. Do I even need to say it? You're already doing it, aren't you? Because you guys are so smart. You're already typing in the chat page 34 or page 34 plus. I know you are. Unbelievable. That is so cool to see, isn't it? Isn't that so cool to see? I mean, you're, you're going through a sew off of this difficulty. The needle's already gotten a heck of a workout. Your setup is not ideal because you're using embroidery thread, you're using a universal type needle, and yet you're going through stuff like this, like this. You get the idea? So I'm going to throw that into the back as a definite pass. That's a no-brainer pass. I mean, it really is. It's like, what? 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 Really? And you can see the work on this motor that I did has really paid off. This machine of Roz's is getting the job done so easily. I mean, so... That was easy. Yeah, exactly. That was easy. Yeah, yeah. That was easy. Yeah. That was easy. It's it's so easy, it's almost ridiculous. But it it, it is what it is. I mean, it's the machine is optimized. It's going to get the job done. So two layers of heavy-grade denim. I'm going to go ahead and fold it in the middle, get us up to four. And then I'm going to fold it one more time and get us all the way up to six. Six layers of heavy grade denim, that's what that looks like. What do you think? Yeah, I know. So I'm gonna slide that underneath the uh, needle and we'll see if this Japanese clone will continue to dance through these sew-offs like it is. I mean, it's just amazing, amazing. Six layers, look at that from the side. That's a little bit intimidating, isn't it? We'll get it done. We'll get it done. Matter of fact, even without a lot of drama and hoopla, let's just get it done right now. Six layers of heavy grade denim. Let's rock and roll. Oh, and let me hold my threads and be a good boy. All right. Hold it until you launch and then you can let them go. So that one I allowed the material to slip a little bit, but I, sew, I sewed through it anyway, and we got her done. So beautiful, beautiful stitching. I can already see it. 
I can already see it, and it's like, what? Seriously? So that is going to be our lock stitch right there. This is going to be our top stitch where I got that little wrinkle because uh, I allowed that material to slip a little bit. So let's take a look at these top stitches first. Again, through six layers of heavy grade denim. Anything but an easy sew off. But we'll see how this Japanese clone, this Stitch Queen, got the job done. Pause right there. Unbelievable. Not not that I went off course there, but this this stitch quality. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous stitching? Oh my gosh. The formation, the integrity of the stitch. Let's look at the totality of stitching. Folks, it does not get any better than that. It really doesn't. That is a solid page 34 plus. Let's turn it over and look at that lock stitch. Try to keep this balanced so it doesn't fall off. All right, let's zoom in on that. So this is our lock stitch through six layers of heavy grade denim. Pause right there. Pause right there. Pause right there. Folks, solid page 34 plus. It just is. Solid page 34 plus. Totality of the stitching. It's absolutely as it should be. Another pass, another... All I can say is we're, we're, we, are, we are working towards a gold medal right now. And this is another step in that direction. And again, look at it from the side. Six layers of heavy grade denim. We're not even all the way down the road yet. And yet, this is what our sew-off sandwich looks like right now. Let me turn my screen so I can see what you're seeing. That's our sew-off sandwich right there. I mean, that was a sew-off sandwich all by itself. Look at that one back here. Our saddle grade leather, we went around and around and around and around and around and around and around. And then we did all this after that. Plus the off-camera ones that I already showed you. So, we could, we could stop right here. But I think we might just go a little bit further. We might just go a little bit further. But I do have a customer arriving soon, so I need to be mindful of that as well. Got to watch my time. I'm in demand. Just now. So, what should we do next? What should we do next? I've done a lot of leather. I'm not going to do any more leather. I've got leather, other leather I could do. I've got protected full grain leather. I've got genuine cowhide. I think we'll wrap up with something a little bit crazy and extreme. We'll do two crazy and extreme things, okay? Why don't we haven't done bubble gum material in a little bit? Why don't we do some bubble gum material? And we're going to do three layers of it. So, if you're new to this channel, the reason it's called bubble gum material is because of this right here. You see that? Incredibly elasticity. Incredible elasticity. Incredible elasticity. I said it twice because I said it wrong the first time. Incredible elasticity. And we're going to try going through three layers of this stuff. And it tends to because it has a high uh, concentration of vinyl. It's going to tend to try to manipulate the stitch. We'll see if we can preserve that stitch integrity through tricky stuff like this. Okay? Let's see what we can do. Oh, 
All right, three layers of bubblegum material. Let's just get this done. Let's just get this done. No drama, no fanfare. We're just gonna buzz through it, okay? All right, here we go. Unbelievable. Wow. Absolutely incredible. Incredible. All right, let's take a look at this. You know what, I might just do it by the camera. I think I will. Let's just zoom in a little bit more. We do it like this. Yeah, yeah, you can see that real clear there. Folks, that is a page 34 plus stitch through three layers of bubblegum material. Three layers of bubblegum material. Let's turn it over and look at the lock stitch, but let me first of all turn it towards the camera so you can see the thickness of what we just went through. And look, it even has a backing on it as well, along with being a high vinyl concentration and slipperier than snot, it's got a backing on it as well. So let's look at that lock stitch now. Unbelievable. Folks, that is so obviously page 34 plus. Look at that. Unbelievable. I'm not even going to dilly dally. I'm going to throw that to the back as well in our sew off sandwich and just declare it a solid victory. So, last but not least, what we're going to wrap up with is a sew off I've only done once before, and you probably already being real smart, you probably already know what I'm talking about. I'm going to be sewing this once I have a clear picture. Hold on. I'm going to be sewing this aluminum can with a rubber backing on it. And I'm using the rubber to prevent any shards of the metal from going into the raceway and also to protect the machine as well. So that's what we're going to be sewing on next and we'll kind of go down and around on it. So let's do that next. And I'm gonna shut this music off as much as I'm enjoying it. I'm gonna shut this music off just temporarily because I want you to listen to this machine plow through this stuff. And the rubberized material is basically like a recycled tire on the back of it. So, I mean, it's going to afford the protection that I want to protect, to, that I want to it's going to afford the protection I want to do to safeguard the machine, but beyond that, it's also going to ensure, and I'm actually going to cut that edge off right there because that's extending out a little bit. It's also going to ensure that the machine surface is protected too once I find my pair of scissors. There we go. I don't want that metal to extend beyond the rubber surface excessively to ensure that the machine is protected. <clears throat> so what I have on the back now is I've got this rubberized surface so it'll slide over the feed dog safely and also ensure that the raceway is protected too. 
Okay, so that's in place. Oops, I gotta advance my thread a little bit more. There we go. Okay, so here we go. It's a single layer of aluminum with a tire type recycled material as a backing. So let's see if we can buzz down and around this a little bit. And uh, I may stop and rotate it manually instead of trying to maneuver it just because I don't want to I don't want to damage the machine patina doing this in the process. Does that make sense? Okay. Alright, so here we go. The final sew off I intend to do on Raz's machine is a aluminum and rubber based sew off. All right, you ready? Here we go. Listen to that sound. You can just tell. Ugh. All right, here we go. Here's where I'm going to make my turn. sure I didn't break my thread. Again, we're sewing with embroidery thread, folks. We're not sewing with upholstery thread or something heavier gauge. We're sewing with embroidery thread. And it looks like I sewed over my thread again. Ah, that's okay. Here, let me do this. Yeah, if I did. I sewed over my thread. All right, let's go down to the finish, and I'll see if I can clean it up. Here we go. Whoops. Press your foot down, Scott. Press your foot. That'll be a mess down there, too. See what happens when you're in a rush? Okay, let's stop there. I'll see if I can clean up my mess now. Oh, yeah, I made a mess. I made a mess. And I'm delighted to say that because of that rubber backing, uh, I'm looking carefully at the, uh, the machine and, and it's perfect. It's perfect just as it was. So, all right, so now I see what I did on the back. See that beautiful stitching all the way around and I create a little bit of a bird's nest right there. So let's see if I can fix that. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Slow but sure. I'm getting it. There we go. Look at that. that actually, that actually undone. That undid. Undone. I did better than I thought it would. And I'm not going to set that on Roz's machine. I'll clip it there. Clip it there. Okay. Beautiful. Let me get out my stitch off holder. And we'll zoom in on this and take a look. All right, let's look at that top stitch first, and then we'll flip it over and look at that lock stitch. And again, I didn't make any adjustment to the presser foot pressure. I didn't make any adjustment to uh, stitch length or anything like that. So we've got a nice full stitch, as you can see. We'll kind of go down and around. And you can scan the barcode and pay the pay the cashier as you leave. Yep. And I will obviously put a brand new needle in the machine. Yeah, there was my little... Remember what I didn't have the presser foot down? And I started... Yeah, yeah, just ignore that. Well, I'm not even going to go around twice. Th those are absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous stitches page 34 easily so totality of the stitching it's a little bit hard to see but you can see it we turn it over let's look at that rubberized material and again we're going to be looking at the lock stitch on the rubberized side 
Now the reason we even do a sew off like this is not just for hoopla. We do it because it's also going to give you an idea of how you might be able to, as the holidays are approaching, how you might be able to use a can like this for a Christmas project. Yeah, ignore that again. That's where I, yeah. And again, we've got a solid lock stitch as well on the back coming through this uh, layer of aluminum and rubberized material. There you've got a real clear view where this, the lights are not blurring it at all. Uh, and that stitch right there is indicative of a page 34, if not a page 34 plus, lock stitch. It's absolutely spot on. Absolutely spot on. So totality of the stitching for this lock stitch. There. That's actually a clear view right there. You can see it. Is absolutely as it should be. Uh, very, very pleased with that. Um, and again, this is after using that needle, that universal needle, for all the other sew-offs that we've done. So to be able to nail it like this, you know, with incredibly high quality stitching, you can see it right there when the lights aren't glaring off of it. Beautiful, beautiful stitching. Beautiful, beautiful stitching up there as well. Uh, is really a testimony. It's a testimony, number one, to Roz's machine, but it's also a testimony to, uh, well, to a number of things. It, it, the, the servicing and the restore that I did of the machine, uh, the caliber of Schmetz needles being the best in the world full stop, as, as Alex loves to say, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. Uh, the, the caliber of this trilobal embroidery thread, which is not really designed to sew aluminum cans and recycle tire, tire material as well, and yet it laid down stitching like this that is just breakworthy. It's just breakworthy. It truly is. So I'm going to come out on the shot a little bit. We're going to look at all of the stitching that we've done on Roz's post-World War II Japanese clone machine. And I think we've tested this machine. And, and the most amazing thing is that Roz's machine has made it that was easy. so easy, it's ridiculous. So easy, it's ridiculous. So let's join our aluminum saw off that we just did. And I'll kind of put it on top of our leather so that we aren't making direct contact with Roz's machine. Now, all of these sew-offs right here, this uh, saddle-grade leather we went round and around with, our aluminum sew-off that we just did with the uh, recycled tire, two layers of uh, elk hide, bubble gum material, three layers of that, six layers of uh, heavy-grade denim, six layers of upholstery, commercial upholstery material, uh, again, two layers of elk hide, I'll add that to the top. Two layers of 100% cotton. Two layers of 100% uh, polyester ribbon material. And last but certainly not least, our three layers of saddle grade leather. Look at that sew off sandwich from the side. That is what the real deal looks like. And not just the quantity, but the quality. The fact that we went through this diverse field of materials and the machine did it effortlessly. Uh, and I would attribute that again to because of, because of the work that I poured into this Japanese clone. Not all, let me say this very clearly, not all Japanese clone machines could deliver, as you've seen in this uh, sew-off Olympics today, this premiere. Don't even buy into that lie that, oh, Scott did that on a Japanese clone machine. All of them can do that. Ah, uh, no. No, not even close. It's, it's the caliber of the machine, but it's also the preparation of the machine to get it ready. It's like training for the Olympics over years and years and years, and then having a few seconds to demonstrate what you can do. Well, we didn't take a few seconds. We took several minutes, even hours, to take this machine through the, uh, the ropes that we did. But this is the result, page 34, page 34 plus stitching through 
everything you can see in front of you right now, and you saw all of this live on the premiere. It wasn't photoshopped, it wasn't window dressing, it's the real deal. And then all of this on top of it was done off camera as well. So that's, that's the difference between this workshop and other places around the world. I'll just say it, is you're gonna see the real deal and the most important thing is you're going to see the machine after it's optimized get the job done that was easy absolutely without any effort and again you're not going to see other machines that are identical to Roz's in the way they look be able to get this done to this level it's unique it's the magic of the workshop it's what I do it's how I roll so with that said let's wrap this up and again I hope you enjoyed seeing some other Japanese clone machines as well that are are similar to Roz's but not the same certainly uh, these blue ones and then that gorgeous black one that I showed you uh, that was on the workbench earlier so any of you that are Japanese clone machine haters and you say I would never ever get a Japanese clone machine eat your heart out as you look at what Roz's did through this premiere and more importantly the caliber of stitching and the ease of stitching through this diverse field of materials it's it's what we do it's what I do in the workshop all right well with that that was your cue to play music Come on. Not really Japanese style music, but you never know. All right, y'all take care and remember, remember the fundraiser. Remember the fundraiser for the Humane Society in Okanto. We're going into our second week. We're still not at goal. We need your help. Make sure you check out the uh, the videos. They're in a playlist on the channel, so you can find out how to get involved, how to help and how to win an amazing behind-the-scenes tour of the workshop, some delicious European chocolate, and be able to pick any machine from my personal collection. It don't get any better than that, folks. It doesn't get any better than that. So check that all out. Get involved. Make a difference. We need your help. The critters need your help. Thanks again, Roz. You are a sweetheart. I appreciate you so much. And I'll be getting this packed up and heading your way this week. So keep watch for it. I'll send you tracking. And all of you out there sitting on the fence, send your machines into the workshop. Come on. Let's do it. Get some world-class service, the best in the world, and uh, you'll never regret it. It's an investment that makes sense. So take care, everybody.